שם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back here on our Stump the Rabbi uh, series, ברוך השם, our longest standing series, we've been doing it for the last several years, and uh, ברוך השם, this is an uh, opportunity for us to uh, answer some questions after giving a little bit of uh, chizuk, some divrei uh, Torah from the weekly parasha, from just different subjects that we do each week. Tonight's shiur will be for the Refua Shlema of uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, uh, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Avi Mori David Ben Esriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and uh, Marsha Bat Julie for her to have Atzlacha uh, Rabba, Bikol Maasi Yadeh, her and her uh, children. And uh, all of Am Yisrael, that, uh, Baruch Hashem, and uh, Righteous Noah highs that continue to support all the wonderful things that the organization is doing. Uh, the um, campaign for the uh, new film, Baruch Hashem, is still uh, going. Anyone uh, that wants to uh, become a uh, sponsor in any, of the, uh, uh, any part of the movie, whether big or small, the uh, website to go to is Gehenom.com. Gehenom is spelled G-E-H-I-N-N-O-M dot com. And there's different opportunities out there, even naming opportunities uh, that won't be up for much longer, but uh, there's a, uh, some naming opportunities for anyone that wants to uh, take a part of that. Uh, also, uh, in regards to uh, some of the uh, other uh, projects that we have, we'll give some more updates on that uh, next week. Uh, so as far as the uh, parasha, we have Parashat uh, Chayes Sarah. There's um, really a uh, so much to learn about Sarah Imenu, and I think that uh, each year when we've discussed this uh, this Torah portion, we've uh, talked about a lot of the other things that are in the parasha, but perhaps today we'll learn a little bit about Sarah Imenu, uh, and also why certain things are what they are, uh, and as well as perhaps maybe if we get some time, uh, address some of the uh, outstanding issues out there relating to some of the things that we talked about, some of the things that are happening in the world. So we'll see. We'll try to uh, minimize it to around about an hour uh, before you guys start asking some questions. Uh, you guys ask questions, and Bezat Hashem, Hashem will give us the answers. Uh, so Parashat Chaya Sarah starts with the uh, tragic death of Sarai Menu. Everyone knows that Sarai Menu was a great tzaddikah, uh, an extraordinary person, but uh, if that wasn't enough, the, uh, the Torah itself testifies that uh, Sarai Menu was an extraordinary person, a very righteous person. Uh, by the way that Hashem puts her, uh, has her age, uh, where he says that uh, Sarah's lifetime was 100 years, 20 years, and 7 years, uh, the years of Sarah's life. Uh, from here, the uh, Chachamim teach us from the Midrash Rabbah that uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, is teaching us that uh, just like the, uh, the righteous people are perfect, so are their years perfect. And uh, in regards to Sarai Menu, when uh, Sarai Menu was 20 years old, she had the uh, beauty of a 7-year-old. And the difference is, uh, obviously, the, uh, you know, while a 7-year-old has natural beauty, that uh, doesn't need any embellishment. Usually the 20-year-old needs to do something, and even if they don't, typically the 20-year-old reaches the peak of their beauty, while the 7-year-old seven seven uh, is only beginning. And the Midrash continues and says that Sarai Menu, when she was 100 years old, she was like a 20-year-old with respect to sins. She was sinless. So Sarai Menu was an extraordinarily righteous person uh, that, uh, of course, each one of us heard a little bit about her, but uh, today we'll, uh, we'll hear a few other things that, uh, that we didn't hear. And uh, one of the things that the Midrash says, that uh, Sarai Menu, uh, Hashem described her as, uh, as uh, tmima, as perfect. Uh, she was a perfect person. As, uh, and Rabbi Yochanan says that she was like an unassuming calf. What's an unassuming calf? Why, why an unassuming calf? Unassuming calf uh, is uh, someone that follows his master. Just like she, uh, she was uh, righteous, she was righteous for a reason. And uh, by uh, righteous, first of all, when it came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Avraham Avinu, Lech lecha me'artzecha, uh, mi'bet avicha, uh, leave your, uh, your home, leave your place, leave everything, Sarai Menu went along with him. She didn't... Uh, 
give any trouble. Today, you know, sometimes they, uh, the husband wants to uh, move to a different city, you know, to get a better job, to start something else. Typically, if the uh, wife uh, likes where she lives, either because she likes the house or her family lives near her, or uh, she simply likes the community, or she just doesn't want to pack, typically the wives give a very difficult uh, time about it. But sometimes it's the wife that wants to move because she wants a bigger house or she wants a different community. She wants to upgrade. And the Gemara says, in fact, uh, after all said and done, when it comes to moving, uh, the one that suffers the most for moving is the husband. The one that suffers the most is the husband. But either way, the, uh, the sages teach us that when it came to moving multiple times, Sarai Menu followed our husband. When it came to having the Brit Milah, Sarai Menu followed our husband. When it came to... Uh, any test that uh, Avraham Avinu had, uh, Sarai uh, uh, um, Imenu went forward with it. And so much so that when she uh, saw that uh, she's not uh, bringing children to the world, she brought Hagar, Hagar the, uh, the Egyptian, and she gave this uh, Hagar to uh, this maidservant to Avraham. And she said, uh, hey, take her and uh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll build a, uh, you know, I'll build from there. What does it mean I'll build from there? What do you think that Sarai Menu was actually going to babysit Ishmael? No, the, uh, what Sarai Menu was in essence saying is that apparently, you know, the, uh, the, the merits that I have, you know, at this point are not enough to bring the child that I want into the world. And uh, I, I want to show Hashem how much I'm willing to sacrifice, how much I'm willing to sacrifice, not only for uh uh for for you know for you to have a, a child so you'll have it with uh with uh with her but even more so how much i want to sacrifice to fulfill his will and she uh in essence how much i'm going to suffer uh, as a result of this hagal and she gave uh hagal to avraham and due to the suffering that she had after that she in essence earned that last merit uh that was required for, for hashem to give her a child to give her yitzhak where she built from it uh, so Sarai Menu was like a perfect calf that follows its owner. Uh, this is also uh, one of the signs of a uh, good wife, uh, where uh, we learn from the sages that if you ever want to know whether the person that you are dating uh, is going to be a good wife or not, see how she treats her, her father. If she treats her father with respect, then you have a good uh, chance that she'll treat you with respect. But if she disrespects her father, certainly you should not marry this person because she'll disrespect you much worse. Even more so, it's important for a woman to follow the ways of her husband, to follow her husband. And that's it. one of the things that is very difficult for women to do today because they're much more liberal. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're looking to, uh, for equality, even though equality is actually a diminishing from their position in the world. Needless to say, in the world today, women don't want to follow. They want to lead. Uh, they they want uh, you know they want the leading position and this is not the way of a righteous woman a righteous woman follows a husband so uh, and again by following a husband this doesn't mean that a woman has to be uh, stepped on and insulted chas v'shalom or anything like that obviously anyone that's watch, watches our shiurim knows this is nothing that we're referring to follows a husband by simply following the direction of the husband as he's the leader but of course at the same token doing what she needs to do in order to fulfill her role in other aspects. Uh, now, Sarai Menu is a, uh, described by HaKadosh Baruch Hu as, a, uh, you know, as, as perfect, and Rabban Yochanan says, this is like an uh, a, 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 um, unassuming calf. Now, the Beta Levi elaborates on this even further, and he says, what is, uh, what is so perfect? What is so uh, perfect? What is this comparison to Sarai Menu? And uh, it has to do with her obedience and faithfulness to, uh, to follow her master without questioning the master. And this is one of the things that uh, is most troubling for people today when it comes to having different life tests. Uh, sometimes you'll see people have, you know, different life tests and they'll say, you know, they'll, they're losing their mind, they're crying, they're hysterical, they, uh, they try everything they possibly can, call whoever they can, write whoever they can, complain as much as they can, and then after they lose all hope, okay, it's in your hands, Hashem. And they think, oh, that means I have, you know, I trust Hashem is going to save me. That's not trust, that's not bitachon, that's not emunah, that's hopelessness. Meaning that if you have tried everything and then after you failed everywhere, you say, oh, Hashem, it's in your hands. That's not faith in Hashem. 
that's you have no other option uh you know you you really believe that you can do something you failed you didn't succeed in it so now to say i trust that hashem is going to help me is not going to uh earn you any brownie points uh but rather if a person continues to do what they need to do you know puts in whatever uh effort is necessary but never for a second thinks that their efforts are what's going to bring them to salvation and they uh, never steer away from the path that they need to go which is the path of Hashem that type of person is closer to having that uh that bitachon what is the missing ingredient the missing ingredient is to be like Sarai Menu where it's that it's that uh, unassuming calf the unassuming calf not only they follow but they follow without any questions meaning they never doubt Hashem they never say what did Hashem uh, why did Hashem do this to me what does he want for me what's this what's that they don't ask these types of questions and that's one of the things that the Beta Levi explains here and he says that the time to ask questions about Hashem is not when you're in the middle of a test it's not when you're in the middle of a difficulty the time to ask questions about Hashem is before those things happen when you're learning Torah because when you're learning Torah you're learning about Hashem you're learning about what he says you're learning about his ways how he treated the people from previous generations how he treated the righteous people how he treated the wicked people how he did what he did throughout all of history so this is the time where you can ask as many questions as you want about Hashem but at the time of test there's no more questions about Hashem why why is he doing this because he wants to do this you'll find out more reasons later on but why because he wants to do it because there's a benefit for it that you perhaps are not aware of that you perhaps are not understanding that you perhaps cannot see but you will see when time comes now if a person wants to climb the righteousness ladder they have to start thinking from that perspective where i have to ask as many questions as i possibly can when i'm learning to lot I have to learn about Hashem and ask questions about the things that I learned to make sure that I understand things correctly. But when the tests come, when the difficulties happen, when the fights happen, when the losses happen, whatever happens, that's not the time to ask questions. Why? Because those questions are not going to help me. Those questions are not going to help me. And in fact, many times people ask the wrong people these types of questions. We can actually bring the person to a place of of heresy. Uh, How so? If a person is doing a lot of good things, they're doing tshuva, they're keeping Shabbat, they're modest, they're doing all the different things that they need to do. And then Hashem sends them the test. Now, if this person is not aware of what we just said, what not aware of what the Beta Levi just said, uh, and we repeated, then this person is going to start complaining. And she's going to complain to our girlfriends, she's going to complain to our husband, she's going to complain to her mom, she's going to complain to her dad, to her sister, she's going to complain to everybody. Oh, I don't understand. Why is God doing this to me? I don't understand. I'm really doing good now. I'm I'm, I'm this now. I'm modest now. I keep Shabbat now. I'm this, I'm that. Why, 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 why? And what ends up happening is that those people that she's asking, if they're not strong, in their belief in Hashem if they themselves do not have bitachon in Hashem having the full confidence in Hashem and in fact if they themselves are not like this unassuming calf that trusts in Hashem faithfully with their eyes closed then what's going to end up happening is that that question is going to fuel the Amalek inside that person the doubts that are inside that person I said you know what you're right you are a good person you're right you are a wonderful person you're right you are a righteous person you kept this and you kept that and oh and i remember you gave tzedakah oh and i remember and you gave to this one hey listen i don't know why hashem is doing this doesn't seem right and all of a sudden that doubt just became real initially it was a doubt that was inside but now when somebody else agreed with you that doubt that amalek amalek and doubt amalek and and, and doubt in hebrew is safek have the same numerical value Uh, that Amalek just took some type of life form now you go to a third person and you tell your sister listen I was talking to dad and dad said that he agrees with me because I gave Tzedaka I gave this I gave that I don't understand why is God doing this to me what do you think and the sister all of a sudden that really was looking for a reason out of this religion reason out out of this modesty reason out of everything she goes you know what this really makes me question the whole thing 
And all of a sudden, this Amalek just got a little bit bigger. And guess what? It gave, a, it gave birth to a baby. It gave birth to a baby because that sister was even weaker than you. Just went completely off. Why? Somebody asked her, I don't understand. Just a month ago, you were going to the seminary. Just a month ago, you were Shomer Nagia. Just a month ago, you were eating kosher. Just a month ago, everything was going good. What happened? Now, listen, I don't know about uh, this, this thing. I think something is wrong. I think the rabbis are lying. I think God is lying. I think he's lying and that's lying. And So what does that have to do with you being a mother? I don't understand. What, what does that have to do with anything? No, listen, I saw my sister is having a tough time. She can't find the shiduch. She's having financial issues. She's this and she's that. That's it. If she, if, and she's a righteous one. I'm just following, trying to follow her footsteps. If she's failing, ah, what, what am I? So I just figured, you know what? Let me at least have a good time and just be me. I'm going to be the real me. And what ends up happening is that little question that you had in your mind and as a result of ignorance gave birth to a much, much worse problem than you can ever imagine. So one of the wonderful things that we learn from the Beta Levi is that, yes, you are 100% allowed to ask questions about God and His Torah and how He runs the world, but this is not the time. When you're in the middle of a fire, someone is suing you, someone's trying to take something from you, someone is hurting you, whatever the case is, you have a pain in your side, whatever test each and every single one of us has, that's not the time to ask questions. You want to ask questions? Open the books and start learning. Once you learn, you understand, keep going. You don't understand? Ask a question. That's the time to ask questions. Don't ask questions when you're in the middle of a fire and you're full of emotions. And even if somebody gave you the right answer, if it doesn't touch that emotional note that you have just perfectly, like a musical note, you're not going to hear it anyway. So it's not going to help you to ask these questions at that time. So it's very important to know that what made Sarah Imenu as great as she is, is because she didn't ask questions. But in fact... We also learned from Sarai Imenu how evil is evil. Meaning that, how did Sarai Imenu die? The Midrash Tanchuma in uh, Parashat uh, Chaye Sarah says in a, uh, uh, in a Siman, uh, uh, um, in section 59, Siman, section 23, Siman 23, says that the Yetzara was very unhappy. The Satan, the Malach Amavit, was very unhappy. Why? He saw that Avraham Avinu is about to earn so much merit from sacrificing his son to Hashem, sacrificing uh, Yitzchak to Hashem, which obviously Hashem told him to stop. This was just a test. Now I know you fear me and so on. But the Satan knew that this act, this test, is going to earn Avraham Avinu so much merit that even his descendants, descendants, descendants are going to still benefit from it. So he tried to do everything possible to ruin it for Avraham. And he tried, if you look at the Midrash, it talks about how the Satan got in his way, raised the water, nearly drowned them, all types of things that happened along the way. But of course, Avraham Avinu screamed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, you're the one that told me to, do, to come here. At least let me get to do this. You told me to come here, bring my son, sacrifice my son, but I have all these difficulties. At least let me do it. And that's when Hashem quieted the Satan, the Satan ran away. Where did he go? He went to Sarah. He went to Sarah, clothed as a man. And he says to Sarah, you know that uh, about the Akedah, right? Sarah says, what? What, what Akedah? What are you talking about Akedah? You know, your son, Yitzhak, your boy, your husband just uh, went to kill him. What? What are you talking about? She starts crying. No, Achaim Sheli, my life, my everything. I love you. Where's my son? What are you talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, you have this. She starts running everywhere, looking. Where's my husband, Avraham? Where's Yitzchak? Where do they go? Where is everything? She sees one of the giants. There were, at those times, there were giants. She says to him, Look, do you see over there? Do you see my husband? And the giant says, hold on, let me see. 
Yeah, yeah, I see him. Yeah, yeah. What else do you see? Well, right now he's tying your son. You know, like, what do you mean tying him? Tying him to what? Tying his shoes? No, no, he's tying him, you know, like a sacrifice. Sarai Menu is crying hysterical. Oh, you know, my Chaim Shevi, my this, my that. Now the Satan knows this is not going to go through. But he wants to do this. He's got an agenda. Then, he and he can go back and forth in a second to see the whole thing live. See her crying and see Avraham Avinu about to slaughter his son at the same time practically. Then once the Akedah is finished, Sarai Menu is crying hysterical. And the Satan comes back. Hey, so what do you think about your son now, huh? She's crying. No, leave me alone. What do you want? Listen, almost died. She starts crying. What would you say? No, no, he almost died. Your husband stopped. Last second. God told him to stop. At that moment, Sarai Menu had so much happiness enter her body that her son is not dead. That her husband didn't kill him. That this was just a test. There was so much happiness going through Sarai Menu. Her heart gave out. She couldn't help it. She couldn't live through it. She died on the spot. Now, of course, when Avraham Avinu comes back and he sees his wife of decades, nearly a century, or more than a century actually, dead on the ground, this is shocking for Avraham. This is a test. Uh, and some say, some of the Chachamim say this was his biggest test. Not just to see his wife dead, but to see it after this. Meaning after you just did this huge mitzvah, following the way of Hashem, literally through thick and thin, do something no one else has ever done before or after or will ever do. This was a unique test for Avraham. He passed it, you would think, Come home, welcome party, balloons, a big buffet, I don't know, all types of things. Maybe get a prize, win the lot of 15 times, and it's a billion dollars each time. You know, something. Instead, what do you see? The wife is dead as on, the, on the floor. So now, Avraham Avinu doesn't ask any questions, doesn't have any doubts, does exactly what the Beta Levi is teaching us here. And says, Avraham Avinu knew this is not the time for questions. This is not the time for questions. Right now, time to bury my wife. Fulfill a mitzvah, bury my wife. I need to go find a cave. And he knows of a cave because he found it through when the angels came to him and he was chasing the calf. He ended up finding the cave of Machpelah and uh, he decided that this is the cave that he wants to buy. Why? The question is, not only why did he want to uh, buy this uh, cave, but why is it called the Cave of Machpelah? Why Cave of Machpelah? So the Midrash Rabbah in Parashat Chaye Sarah says, because this is the one that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kipel, he uh, kifef, he, uh, uh, he bent or he uh, minimized the size of Adam Rishon in order to bury him in this cave. Meaning this is the cave, the reason why the Me'arat HaMachpelah is called Me'arat HaMachpelah is because of the act that Hashem do, did to uh, minimize the size of Adam Rishon in order to bury him in this cave. And this is also the cave that you have a, a, a Chava in there as well. So uh, this was a holy cave and uh, this is something that the Midrash teaches us is a, uh, the reason behind why Avraham Avinu was willing to pay any price for this. The question we have, and we should have at least, is why, why does the Satan want all of this? Like, what does the Satan have against Avraham? What does the Satan have against Sarah? Why is he doing all of this? Why is he so mean? Now, of course, you could easily say, that's his job. His job is to be mean. His, his job is to be evil. His job, okay, fine. But the truth is that we already know from the Gemara in Masechet uh, Rosh Hashanah and many other places that a Kadosh Baruch Hu already decides on Rosh Hashanah how long each person is going to live and when they're going to die. So the truth is that whether Sarai Menu died on that day through the horrible, evil act of the Satan fooling her, making her happy and doing all of this, or 
he didn't do all of this Hashem would have still given him the permission to kill her that day if not from this then from something else why do all of this I mean if it was time to go it was time to go so it's not like Sarah Imenu was uh short changed years this was her time to go so why the whole evil theatrics behind everything the Chachamim teach us that the Satan had a agenda the agenda was to try to to do everything possible in order to stop Avraham Avinu from earning this great merit once he failed once he failed at earning the, uh, at stopping Avraham the Satan had plan B what was plan B go to Sarah do something that looks off so when Avraham Avinu comes back from his extraordinary trip he sees that his wife is dead in a unseemly manner and he's gonna say you know what why did I do all of this is this if this is what I get why did I just sacrifice my son why was I why did I jump into the fire why did I do this and why did I do that if this is what I get why meaning to lead Avraham Avinu to chas v'shalom regret the mitzvah because once you regret it that's it all of that merit you just earned is gone now this by the way is still relevant today the Rambam Paskins about 850 years ago in his Yad Chazaka that the worst thing that a person can do to themselves literally spiritual suicide is to regret their mitzvot you just gave fifty thousand dollars you want to sponsor for you and for another person a place in the next game no movie in order to earn merits for eternity that's going to help people do tshuva you put some money behind it or even yet you have the money you put hundred fifty thousand dollars you want this movie to get out there to as many places as possible and you want to share in everybody's mitzvot you press the button you wire the money you send the money online whatever the case is and everything goes a day later you turn on your computer you turn on the cnbc to see what's going on with the market you see the market is down 15 percent your personal portfolio is down 40 percent and you're like you know what if this is what i'm gonna get if i'm gonna lose this kind of money right after doing a mitzvah who needs to do mitzvot guess what you just lost everything you just made the biggest mistake of your life you just regretted a mitzvah even more so a person does tshuva starts keeping shabbat starts keeping talat mishpacha starts keeping kosher starts keeping everything doesn't go to any of these uh questionable kosher institutions that still operate on shabbat no you go you, you keep you do everything good now one day something bad happens i don't have to name the examples of bad things that could happen in a person's life because the world would end and the examples wouldn't end and this person that's now about you already for three four five years everything is going good something bad happens and they say you know what I don't know about this chuba I don't know about this if this is what a God is gonna give me why should I be religious or the worst yet a person lives through their life operates builds a family of 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 Torah of mitzvot of everything the kids brought into the world little tzaddikim with the payout little tzaddikot with the long dress that reaches their toes because she's not going to walk around with a half of a mini skirt and called being religious everyone is righteous everyone is proper everyone is holy but he's still struggling with a few things such as making a living still struggling with a few things such as you know having a job that's going to last for more than a year or two he's still struggling with a few things but he keeps going and he keeps pushing 
And one day, he sees an old friend, his boy from back in the day. His boy used to go clubbing with. His boy used to have a good time with. And he sees his boy that's still secular with his arm around some potato and he is driving a $500,000 car, wearing a million dollar watch, glasses that are 500 bucks and shoes that are probably around 2,500. And his friend smiles at him, yo, Yossi, what's up, man? How are you? And Yossi that now calls himself Yosef, doesn't know where to bury himself. Why? He's embarrassed of himself because he's religious. He's embarrassed of himself because he used to be boys with this guy and he got out of the partnership because he didn't want to do business with somebody that is Mechalet Shabbat. He left the business. He left the business. He found a wife. He built a house full of Kedusha, but he sees his boy from back in the day that he hasn't seen in 10, 15 years. Walking around with some prostitute and a million dollar car now and everything looks good. And Yosef, that's now being called Yossi in the middle of the street, has so much jealousy burning in his heart. He starts thinking, you know what? I think I made the wrong choice. If I would have stayed with this guy, I would also have this billion dollar company like him. If I would have stayed with this guy, I probably would have also had a tomato or two on my arms. If I would have stayed with this guy, I probably would have had two or three of those million dollar cars and a half a billion dollar portfolio just like him. What do I have to show for it? For my choices? Well, I have my wife that's just finished the pregnancy, so our figure is not exactly ideal. She doesn't look like this tomato. And she certainly doesn't look like what she was when I married her. I have these five kids that are driving me crazy. I have tuition for yeshiva that I can't even afford. I have a car from Henry Ford's original uh, factory. A hundred years ago. What do I have? And all of a sudden, all of the mitzvot, all of the blessings that God gave him, seem like nothing in his own eyes and this is in his heart not in his mouth and he regrets it and this rabotai karim is the worst tragedy that could ever happen to this person because at that moment he loses the merits that he earned all of that torah that he learned all of that chesed that he did all of the stuff that he did gone why? He doesn't realize. Akadosh Banhu pays reward both in this world and the next world. It's not necessarily reward that's at your timing, and it's not necessarily the reward that you think. But he certainly pays reward. He also pays a reward to the haters, to the Mechalel Shabbat, to the idol worshippers in this world. But the difference is the reward that you get. In the next world is eternal. The reward that you get in this world is to build you to be able to earn an even bigger reward in the eternal world. The reward that your friend from 10 years ago, the word that he gets, well, the reward that Hashem gives him is in order to destroy him because he has no good left for him in the eternal world. Only Gehenom. But now that you've regretted it, you have to start from fresh. You have to start anew. And this is what the Satan was trying to do to Avram Avinu. He just did the greatest thing any man could ever do. Satan wanted to take it just like that. But he didn't succeed, Baruch Hashem. Hence the reason why Am Yisrael was able to survive Many of the tragedies they did because of the merit of Avram Avinu. But this is only because Avram Avinu knew that during this test, that's not when you ask God questions. That's not when you ask God questions. 
after everything was said and done Avraham Avinu was afraid was afraid that there's going to be more tests not just I was thrown in a fire at Ur Kasdim not only that the uh, Akedat Yitzchak not only the war with the four kings not only this and not only that and after all of it the death of his wife and on top of it the Marat Machpela all of this Avraham was scared but then Akadosh Baruch Hu says to Avraham don't worry this is the last test how could it be the last test I'm alive so long as a person is alive there's going to be tests and in fact the way that Akadosh Baruch Hu shows somebody that he loves him he tests the righteous people the more righteous a person is the more Hashem loves him and to show you that love Hashem tests you test you to see if you love him back test you in order to build you test you in order to give you a greater reward than you can handle so he tests you but now Avraham is afraid are the tests going to get even worse than this and a, and a Kadosh Baruch Hu says to Avraham Avraham that was the last test from here on you're going to live peaceful life no more tests how could it be someone else was born and is taking over the tests who is it remember in last week's parasha where it said that his Avraham's brother Nachor his his uh, wife Milka who was also Sarai Menu's sister she gave birth and one of the kids name was Utz Utz is taking over the tests his name will be known as Job he's taking over the tests this is also the reason why in the beginning of uh, uh, the book of Job the whole uh, book of Job starts with the argument between Hashem and the Satan about how the Satan says that uh, Job is great but uh, he's not uh, as, as great as, as Avraham well, Avraham is greater than this and of course the Gemara debates this who what when of course Avraham was greater but nonetheless the Satan says to Hashem that Job is not even going to pass the test uh, if you give him a test if you give me freedom with him he's not going to pass the test and Hashem says give him a test he'll pass so all of that difficulty that was supposed to come to the light to, to the world Uts took it Job so now Rabutai, we see a little bit different perspectives of where things are where they have been the Midrash continues and says what is it with this description of 127 years that Sarai Menu why do we need to know it so well okay so we learned that she was righteous hence Hashem was counting each of her days because the days were perfect and she was a perfect person but the Midrash says there are many other things you can learn from that what else the Midrash says that Rabbi Akiva was once sitting and teaching Torah and he noticed that the people that he was teaching Torah weren't understanding his lofty Torah and were falling asleep falling asleep even Rabbi Akiva had people fall asleep in his shield how could that be human nature hasn't changed so Rabbi Akiva in his ultimate uh, extraordinary wisdom says best way to 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 wake people up is with a story and he says to people look at this Sarai Menu lived 127 years what do we why why do we need to know 127 this way that way what is it It says because HaKadosh Baruch Hu made sure that for each one of her years you'd know that she's righteous and for each one of those years she's going to get certain benefits from it both in this world and the next yeah but she's dead the benefits don't end there yeah but it's all about how can we know no 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 the benefits are not just in all about it's even in this world Rabbi Akiva tells his students says you remember that there was a queen not that long ago named Esther and Esther through the whole story of Purim married 
Achashverosh, the king of the whole world at the time, 127 countries, after the whole story of destroying Haman and everybody doing tshuva and Mordechai and everything, after all said and done, who was in control of 127 countries? Esther. Esther was in control of 127 countries. What merit did Esther have for Hashem to give her such a gift that she is going to be in control of 127 countries? It wasn't her merit. It was her grandmother's merit. Sarai Menu. Sarai Menu. Her, uh, her award was also transferred to Estelle, her granddaughter. Further, we see that the Midrash tells us about Ephron. Ephron, the greedy animal that when Avraham Avinu came to the uh, people of Chet to buy the cave, the Hittite people or Chet and Shechet uh, said, no, you, anything you want. He says, well, I want this particular cave. So if you could talk to the owner, Ephron, and Ephron was there. And Ephron said, ah, oh, no, don't worry. Whatever you want, it's yours. You want the cave? Not only I'll give you the cave, I'll give you the cave and the whole land surrounding it. For you, for free. Everybody says, wow, look at that, Ephron. Chazaku Baruch Ephron. Everybody's impressed. Ephron is now not only a, uh, a big Baal Chesed giving, uh, uh, doing such a charitable thing in front of everyone, but he's doing it with Avraham. Avraham was world, 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 known worldwide. He was an extraordinary person. They called him the man of God. So you just did a favor to the man of God. Oh, wow. Oh, you know, makes a whole big thing. It's the papers. You know, the... Uh, the Wall Street Journal has a whole special on it. Even the New York Times covers it. Of course, they manipulated it to see, you know, Avram robbed the throne or something, or some type of other distorted thing. But nonetheless, this is what happens. Ephron does this in front of everybody. After everybody gives him the ooh, wah, 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 Avram and Ephron go to the side to see how this transaction is actually going to be finalized because Avram needs to make sure this is not just talking i need to go bury my wife i need to make sure it's my land because i'm not going to bury it if it's not my land Ephron says avram what's 400 shekel between you and me nothing you're so rich we're friends i'm gonna give it to you for 400 shekels the midrash says this was an extraordinary price in a negative way he was literally robbing avram blind what happened to free that you just said at the podium with the microphone announcing to the whole world that you're giving this land for free and the cave he asked for the cave you're giving him the cave and the land for free he didn't ask for free he was willing to pay you full price but you said for free now you're saying not only you're saying you want money for it but on top of it you're charging him something that's a hundred times the real price what happened this is the way of the wicked they say a lot and do little. They say a lot and do little. The Midrash says, Ephron thought that he was getting a real big benefit here. Why? He's going to get a bunch of money. Avram has to bury his wife somewhere. He has his eyes on this cave. He's going to pay me this price. And once he pays me this price, I'm the richest man in the land here i'm famous too because no one knows that he paid me for it anyway so i look like i'm generous and at the same time i'm rich you know similar to some of these billionaires in the world that say yeah listen i'm gonna donate all my billions of dollars yeah right anyone that believes these lies should uh should come to me and maybe i'll sell you a few bridges just tell me which bridge you want i'll sell it to you all it is is a tax strategy where they move their money from there from their personal accounts to corporations to different uh, foundations and trusts just in order to avoid taxes 
because a death tax in, a, in, a, in, a, in the United States is even more expensive than a living tax. But naive people will believe these people would put headlines on them and say, oh, this guy is giving everything he has to charity. And yeah, okay, sure. They gave it to charity and they're uh, barely eating now. Now, a person that has lived in the world and knows a few things knows that Ephron is similar to those people. And needless to say, a wicked person that thought that he can fool the system. Well, you can fool people, but you can't fool God. And the Midrash says, in regards to Ephron and his greed, it's written, The uh, Shlomo HaMelech says in Proverbs, chapter 28, verse 22, one over eager, one that's over eager for wealth, is a person who has an evil eye. He does not know that loss will befall him. This is describing a fund, and surely somebody that all of us know. Everyone knows such a person that's over eager to to succeed, over eager to have wealth. That he's willing to step on a few people on the way if necessary. He's willing to not look when he needs to look, not help when he needs to help. He's so eager to succeed. He is willing to cross all lines, and in fact. When he sees somebody else succeed, he can't stand it. You know, like one of those people that comes to your house and instead of like just sitting down wherever you tell him to sit down or stand wherever you tell him to stand, he starts checking out your house or she's checking out your house. Oh, wow. Where would you get this chandelier? Why, you want to buy one? No, no, I just want to know where you got it. Why? Are you in a chandelier business? You want to figure out the manufacturer of the chandelier? Maybe you can call them in China, or maybe they got it in Singapore, or perhaps they got it in Thailand. Well, what's to you where I got the chandelier? How much you pay for it? Are you a financial advisor, or are you in the business of maybe you, maybe you want me to sell it to you on eBay? You're going to have some profile, and you're going to pretend like you want to buy What What is it? Why do you care where I bought the chandelier, or how much I pay for it? Oh, how much did you pay this out for us? I'm not selling the house. No, no, I'm just interested. I mean, you know, I'm just interested. But you have a house, right? Yeah, yeah, you have a house. So, so why do you care why I paid for my house? Are you renting or are you? did you buy? Wait, excuse me? If I'm renting or I'm buying, wait, neither. Last I checked, the check that I write every month, it doesn't go to you. So you're not the mortgage company and you're also not the landlord. Why do you care if I bought the house? Or I rent the house. What's it to you? Or are you trying to measure me up? Like you're trying to figure out how much money I have? How many rooms does this have house? Why, you want to sleep over? Why do you want to know how much, how many rooms I have? These types of questions are questions of people that are over eager for success and cannot stand seeing somebody else succeed. They simply can't. Midrash says in the name of Shlomo HaMelech in Proverbs, they give evil eye, Ainara. And this ends up bringing failure to them. Evil eye surely is not good for the person receiving the evil eye. But if the person receiving the evil eye is good, is righteous, and everything is good, in essence, he can have protection. But the person that gives evil eye doesn't realize that what when they see that chandelier, that house, the, the uh, mortgage, or the rent, or whatever they're jealous of, they actually end up bringing bad on themselves. Because jealousy is the worst thing that a person can have. You're simply guaranteeing yourself that you will never be happy. How do you know if somebody is jealous? Simple. Usually people like to complain if you have one of those people that are complainers and they like to complain about whatever it is they want to complain if you have the ability to do something give them something you know they complain give them i don't know a ticket to uh, i don't know go uh, to a, some kosher show or give them i don't know a gift card or just give them an invitation to come over give them something and you'll see something something very interesting what they'll stop complaining Wait, but they were complaining 
about the car. They were complaining about their job. They were complaining about something. What does that have to do with the gift card? What does that have to do with the invitation? What does that have to do with anything that I gave them? I gave them a little fish in a bowl. What, why did they stop complaining? Interesting. Because their complaints are deep-rooted, connected to their jealousy. And that's what ends up happening. People complain because they, somebody else has what they want. And even more so, now they have less than what they thought they have. So many times a person will come to people's houses and not even realize that what they're doing is being jealous by asking these questions about what you have and how much you have and so on. If you want to pacify them, either show them the exit or just give them something as like a gift of some kind. I don't know, something minuscule, but you'll see that this little gift, this little thing sometimes will pacify and contain their jealousy until they leave. So, here we see, Rabotai, that Shlomo HaMelech teaches us that an overeager for wealth has an evil eye and he doesn't know that the loss will befall him. Then the Midrash continues, says that an overeager for wealth is a person who has an evil eye, and this is referring to Ephron, who put an evil eye on the money of the righteous person Avraham Avinu. But he doesn't know that loss will befall him. What loss befell? Ephron, that forevermore, from that day on, instead of getting the ultimate recognition, the ultimate glory that he could have ever gotten, which is not only to be recognized by his community, not only to be recognized by Avraham Avinu himself as a giver, as a righteous person, as an honest person, instead of getting that, not only there, but even in the Torah, meaning he would have eternally been known as someone that's a giver, that's a generous person, that's a righteous person, that's everything. Instead, he's known as the opposite. As the Torah removes one of the letters in his name, the Vav that's in his name, within that same verse, where in the beginning of the verse, the word Ephron, the name Ephron is spelled with a Vav, but at the end of the verse and every other time after that for the rest of the times in the Torah, in this week's parasha and other, other times in the Torah, his name is missing that Vav. Hashem took that from him. All of the good that he would ever be remembered for is gone. So now it's, you would think, okay, so maybe the community found out that he really took money when he said he'd donate. So they don't really give him the honor. So the people that would have actually done business with him because he was so generous are not going to do business with him because they found out that he actually gypped uh, 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 Avram, took so much more from him. Okay, so he loses there. But that's just a temporary loss. It's a loss that only affects him during his lifetime. This loss is for eternity. This is also an example of the difference in the way that Hashem thinks versus the way we think. When we think of bad, we think of something limited. We think of good, we think of something limited. Why? We're limited creatures. We have flesh and blood. So when you tell people you have eternal reward for this tzaka, a person really doesn't understand what that means. Doesn't understand why someone that is contained in a body doesn't truly have the capability of understanding eternally until he learns an enormous amount of Torah and even then it's impossible at the same token the heretics use the same strategy where they say ah come on the rabbi said eternal Gehenna no come on why would God punish somebody forever okay so even if he punishes you for a few months but not forever God is, that, that would make God evil, they'll tell you. Because they think, ah, forever is too long. It's too long forever. Even forever punishment, it's too long. Maybe six months, maybe even six years, but not forever, which is a heretical statement. Why? Because God does think in forever. And this is one small example of it. Ephron is being punished forever. Why? Because our Torah is forever. 
He will forever be recognized as this wicked person. And that can never change. So if a person understood how much a single letter is worth that's inside the Torah, they would understand what I mean when I say that this punishment is forever. So a person needs to learn from there that if you find yourself being jealous of others, learn more about Emuna, learn more about Bitachon, learn more about Yirat Shamaim, learn more Torah, and not more about people. Learn about the things you need to do and focus on what you have to do, not what other people have done. Pray to Hashem to bless you. Don't count the blessings that He gave to somebody else. And last but not least, always realize that whatever you see other people have, first and foremost, it's not yours. So there's no reason for you to be jealous. Number two, that blessing can sometimes be a curse. There was a guy that was put on the cover of, uh, I think it was Forbes, just a year or two ago as the greatest, one of the greatest minds of the generation, a guy that went from, you know, being a, having a decent job, decent living, decent everything, to $32 billion. In literally what seemed like overnight, through this Bitcoin crazy nonsense. Now he made a fortune, and they put him as this guy is the greatest and the best, and blah, 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 blah. Well, no one in their right mind, unless they're a Ben Torah that sees real life for what it is, no one in their right mind would have thought that it was only a short period of time later that this very same person ends up losing all of his money. Not three billion out of the 32, not five billion and not even 10, but all of the money is gone in two days. Literally, the money was lost faster than it was gained. Now, if you think about it, oh, 32 billion, that's a lot of money. No, no, you don't understand. 32 billion is enough for civilizations. 32 billion dollars, that means that he could have literally bought a million dollars worth of stuff. He could have bought a million dollars worth of pens, a million dollars worth of hot dogs, a million dollars worth of paper, and a million dollars worth of ink. Whatever he wanted, every single day throughout the whole year, and it wouldn't even scratch the surface of what he had. Because a million dollars a day, 365 days a year, according to the Gregorian calendar, what is it? $365 million. That's not even 1%. Or actually, it is exactly 1% of what he had. So, a person thinks a million dollars, I need to want to buy a million dollar house. Ooh, that's all the money I ever could have. And This guy could have spent a million dollars a day and it wouldn't scratch the surface. In fact, he could have spent a hundred million dollars a day. A hundred million dollars a day. And he'd still have some change. So, to think in that kind of magnitude, you're like, who could lose? Forget about 30 billion. Who could lose a hundred million dollars? And not only lose a hundred million, but in two days? Yes. Why? Lia Kesev Velia Zaav Neuma Shem Tsevaot. Akadoshba who says, Mine is the money, mine is the gold. Hashem the master of legion said. A person that does not recognize their creator will eventually get to meet him, but not on nice terms. And we see this happening throughout all of history. Needless to say, it always happens even during our times. It's happening to people like Mike, uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg from Facebook, losing over $100 billion in a matter of uh, months. Or this guy, 30 billion, other people have lost their fortunes. But guess what? Those horrible but real stories, you don't hear too much about. You know what you do hear about? The fantasy. The one that made it. The one that did it. The one that went from his garage to having a $100 million business. And you can do it too. Why? 
This is part of the world of lies. The Yetzirah doesn't want you to see those realistic, inevitable failures that happen to the wicked. He wants you to see those successes. Why? Because you'll follow them and leave God. If you saw all the failures that truly happen in the world, you wouldn't be enamored when you hear somebody made so much money. You wouldn't be flabbergasted if you hear somebody succeed in such a thing. In fact, you wouldn't even be impressed if somebody told you that they have so much money. Why? It doesn't mean anything. Because it's just something that's paper that Hashem gives and Hashem takes. It's not for eternity and it's not even yours. When a person doesn't follow that and is impressed every time they hear that somebody made a $20 million contract, unfortunately that person is already on the path to destruction. Why? Because they're sitting in the back seat and the Yetzirah is driving. Instead of being impressed by the creator of all creations, they're impressed by the illusions of the Yetzirah. So here we see Ephron, the wicked Ephron, lose everything in a single transaction and suffering for it forever. Last but not least, the Midrash says, what is it on the opposite end? What is it on the opposite end? Meaning if somebody does something good, somebody does something good, let's see. The Midrash Rabbah says, it says, the Pasuk says, and Avraham, as Avraham has purchased in the view of the children of Chet, comes Rabbi Elazar and says, how much ink is spilled and how many quills are broken in order to write in the Torah the children of Chet, the Hittite people. Ten times the Torah writes the children of Chet, the children of Chet. Why is it necessary to give these people so much honor? This is the same transaction with Ephron. But this is not mentioning Ephron, it's mentioning the children of Chet. Why did the Torah give them so much honor? To teach us ten times symbolic of the Ten Commandments. Why the Ten Commandments? To teach you that whoever assists in business dealings of a righteous person, as the children of Chet did to Avraham, is considered as though they fulfilled the Ten Commandments. And Rabbi Udan says, the name Brazilai is written five times, corresponding to the five books of the Torah, to teach us that whoever gives a slice of bread to a righteous person is considered as though he fulfilled the entire five books of the Torah. From here we learn how the children of Chet, the Hittite people, that said to Avram, listen, whatever you want, we're here to help you, and they actually genuinely meant it. When Ephron was there, they told him, get up, talk to Avram, help him out. They helped the transaction happen. They didn't know that Ephron is going to cheat, lie, and be a piece of garbage. They didn't know. They wanted to help Avram because he was a righteous person. For that little bit of brokering, they, they got an eternal fee. What fee? They're recognized in the Torah ten times as if they kept the Ten Commandments. Why? You helped the righteous person? HaKadosh Baruch Hu will reward you eternally. Needless to say, if a person helps other Jews do tshuva, the reward is exponentially higher than even this. So when a person sees the Torah for what it really is, there is literally no smarter person in the world than such a person. But when a person doesn't see the Torah for what it really is, and they see it for what the Yetzirah wants you to see it as, then of course the Yetzirah can fool us in so many ways that before we know it, something that was supposed to be a gift ends up being a robbery. 
with this said hopefully this gives all of us better mindset of some of the missing links to this week's parasha there's much more to say but i know you guys have some questions i see it on the screen there's some questions so we'll go to your questions after i get a drink bezat hashem okay first question jeremy's asking i saw my line oh your question is gone sorry i started reading it but then somebody else asked the question which deletes the previous questions so we'll have to go to the next one uh let's see Daniel is asking, what happens when we want to say Divrei Torah and we don't remember the source right at the moment? Would it be better not to say it, lest we end up getting kavot for it? No. What you do is uh, the Mishnah in Masechet Avot says that a person that uh, uh, says Divrei Torah has to say the source of where he got it from, because when he does, he is bringing the Mashiach even closer, just like we learned from Esther. When she said to Achashverosh that there are people that are out there to kill you, and I found this out from uh, from uh, Mordechai, this ended up bringing uh, the salvation to all of Am Yisrael. So when you bring the sword, because she brought the source, if she would have said, listen, uh, I found out these people are looking to kill you, and she wouldn't have mentioned Mordechai, then when uh, later on, when uh, the, the king had the, uh, the dream, or he couldn't go to sleep, and so on, and the angels were beating him up, and he had to look through his book of uh, memories, the story of Mordechai wouldn't have been there. And that was, in essence, a key part to this ultimate salvation of Am Yisrael at that time, which we'll learn further about during Purim. At the same time, the Mishnah says that someone who mentions a part of the Torah and does not mention the source, uh, he is uh, slowing down the salvation. But this is not referring to somebody that forgot the source. This is someone that's claiming that he is the source. But if somebody forgot the source, they could simply say, this I heard, I heard in a shiul Torah, or I read in a, in a book, I just don't remember which shiul, or I don't remember which book, but it's certainly in the Torah, it's not my original idea, uh, that's not a problem at all. Plenty, plenty of uh, uh, chachamim uh, give shiurim and do not even mention sources uh, as, uh, as often as others. Uh, but if you ask them what the source is, they'll tell you. But they don't necessarily mention it all the time, and sometimes they don't even remember it. All the, you know, people are still people, but uh, it, they don't claim that those, uh, uh, those insights, those thoughts are their own. If a person claims it as his own, then he's considered a thief. So he's slowing down the ultimate salvation. But if he says, listen, I read this in the Torah, I just don't remember where, no problem. That's a, uh, he can do it, and he should sh- certainly share Torah. Is better than not sharing Torah. Uh, next. Okay, Nikolai is asking two questions. Someone said not to say you to your rabbi uh, refers to uh, refer to him as third person. Kind of odd, because we say you to Hashem all the time. So is the uh, rabbi greater than Hashem? Uh, no. It's a, uh, when, you, when you're talking to, uh, to, when you're talking to your rabbi, you're, uh, you know, usually you're talking to him directly, and you say, Kvod Arav. You say, uh, Kvod Arav. You say, uh, Rabbi. You don't say you. It's just simply uh, not, uh, uh, it shows that you don't have any uh, respect for him. But he's a, in essence, uh, the respect that you have for the rabbi is not for the rabbi himself, but the respect that you have for his Torah, which in essence is respect for Hashem. But uh, when we are saying you to Hashem, we're saying you because He is one. There is no, there's nobody else aside from Him. So when we say uh, that you are the one that brings us salvation, you are the one that helped us, you, 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 meaning we're, we're uh, directing our words that this is the only place. There is an od milvado. There's nothing else but you. There's just you. So it's a different type of you. It's, a, it, it's the opposite of the you that a person would use for their rabbi. The you that a person is using for their rabbi is a, is a lack of respect for the rabbi's Torah. The you that a person is using uh, for Hashem is actually an increased level of, uh, of emunah and bitachon in Hashem uh, because you know that everything is coming from Him. Uh, second is, how can you fear your rabbi like heaven if he doesn't know certain gemara and shuchan aruch? Uh, what the what the rabbi knows or doesn't know is uh, not necessarily uh, always apparent to people. 
Uh, some people think that a rabbi knows a lot more than what he really does. Uh, many times you hear people say that, oh, my rabbi, or this such and such rabbi, watch a shurim, he knows the entire Torah. Or the best I've heard is the, uh, which makes me sick to my stomach, is when people say, oh yeah, you see this guy? He's the next rabbi of Adya. He's the next rabbi of Adya, this one. And they don't even realize what that even means. They don't even realize what that means. And uh, unfortunately, what ends up happening is they give uh, either too much respect or too little respect to the Chachamim. To give you guys a little bit of an idea, actually, Basiyat Nishmai, I wanted to, to bring this up uh, at some point, I just didn't know when, but uh, due to this question, I think that this is a good time. There was one time a, uh, uh, a, big, uh, a big issue at the, uh, where the Tnuat Shas uh, was, uh, you know, was started, with, with, you know, and uh, initially, uh, Rav Avadi was part of it, obviously, but you also had Rav Shach. And initially, the people would go to Rav Shach for questions. He was the elder, the, the, the Chacham of the door, the, 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 the giant of the generation. Um, and, but later on, the, uh, the um, uh, Rav Shalom Cohen and the rest of the Chachamim, they were all Sephardis, they started asking all of their questions to Rav Ovadia. And uh, Rav Shach once uh, saw uh, Rav, you know, Rav Shalom Cohen that came to see him. And he said, why did you leave me? He said, well, Kodera, Rav, we never left you. What do we do? He goes, no, how come you, uh, you don't ask me anymore? You only ask uh, your rabbi over there, Rabbi Ovadia. And at the time, there was actually a machloket in the, uh, in the shita of how to deal with the government between Rav Ovadia, who was very young at the time, or, you know, in comparison to Rav Shach, was you know, a few decades younger than him. There was a machloket between them of how to deal with the government because Rav Ovadia was to say, listen, you can deal with these lefty liberals and take their money and build Torah institutions with them. Whereas Rav Shach was of the mindset of, no, don't deal with the Reshaim. Connection to the Reshaim will, uh, is bad. Don't deal with them. So there was a machloket between them. Uh, but of course, everything for Shem Shemaim, still, you know, Rav Shach didn't understand why they're going to this younger rabbi. Like, who is he? So Rav Shalom Cohen was scared to death. He said, when, you know, it's a, it was like shaking. Gdol Ado is asking, why'd you leave me? What do you say? He says, does Kod Arav have Yabi Omer? And he says to him, uh, no, you know, I, I, I don't uh, delve into that. I'm more into Gemara and other things. I, I don't... But do you have a copy of the Yabi Omer, the Rav Vadya? Because one volume, one volume I have. But I never read it. He said, which one? He says, I have the Abi Omer, the uh, uh, the Chelik Revi, the fourth uh, volume. And uh, he says, okay. So Rav Shalom Cohen is extraordinary Talmud Chacham, knew the Abi Omer practically by heart. Uh, you know, it's, it's and open up the Abi Omer. And he opens up the Abi Omer in the uh, Siman Lamed Dalit, Or Chaim Siman Lamed Dalit, which is a answer to that someone, a question that somebody asked Rav Ovadia about Dut Shemesh, about whether you're allowed to enjoy the uh, uh, hot water that's coming from a, uh, a solar panel, but a, not solar panel, uh, uh, water that's heated by the sun. And this Rav Ovadia wrote when he was only 39 years old. Now, Rav Shalom Cohen tells Rav Shach, please, Kvod Rav, read this, learn this one, over the next week, it's almost a 50-page tshuva, and I'll come back next week, and I'll explain to you why. So Rav Shalom Cohen leaves him, a week later he comes back, and as soon as he comes in, Rav Shach says, Oi, I didn't know he was such a gadol, such a giant among men. I didn't know that we have such people in, in, in the world today. Didn't know we have in the Sephardi community, you guys have such a gadol. Of course, listen to him. Everything he says you do. What happened? What happened? What, I mean, what, did, what could Rav Ovadia possibly write that Rav Shach 
This is one of the Gdole Ado. This is not just uh, somebody you could impress with a YouTube video. What could he possibly find in this tshuva that would completely transform his opinion of Rav Ovadia to the point of from not even recognizing him as anything special to he is Gdolado. What? Now, of course, the Chuvai itself, there's not enough time in the day to go through it. But a person that looks at this Chuva only needs to know a few things. First of all, this Chuva was written nearly 60 years ago. Obviously, this is before the internet before Google, before all of that stuff. It was also written at the time, Rabbi Vadia was a rabbi in Egypt. He didn't have a chavuta, didn't have all of his uh, uh, access to, to, a, to other chachamim, books. He wrote this and he toiled and toiled to answer this question that some Talmud Chacham asked him. Some Talmud Chacham from Eretz Yisrael asked him and he gave him the answer and in this answer if you count the amount of Torah sources that Rav Ovadia quotes verbatim from his mind not from Google, not from asking somebody, did you ever hear such a thing? How many sources would you estimate? 50 page answer approximately. You would say, if somebody ever wrote anything, like an essay for a school, maybe used five sources, 15 sources, 50 sources. And you say, okay, so that's Rav Ovadia. So perhaps I wrote 50 sources in my thesis paper for college or grad school perhaps of avadya maybe for what he wrote he wrote let's say 500 sources and you'd be wrong 1082 sources but unlike you and everybody else out there that uses google and all types of technology it's easily accessible and possible and good to use this is all from his toiling of Torah in his mind so when a person can write a tshuva like this and name a thousand and eighty two sources in it the only question his sons had for him is why so many we already got the point after the first source after the first paragraph you already convinced us Rabbi Vadya answers him and says you have to understand, I was in Egypt. I was alone. I didn't have any chavuta. I didn't have any talmidei chachamim. So I don't know. Maybe after the first argument, I figured when somebody reads it, maybe they'll have a question about it and they'll disagree with me. So let me prove it in another way. And then after that, I figured, yeah, but maybe they will disagree with this because of this other reason. So let me address this and this and this and this and every possible thing you can. And of course, I have to bring the sources. Shh. All in there. If you did it with a computer, you still wouldn't be able to succeed. So when somebody says, oh yeah, my rabbi or the rabbi that I watch on YouTube, he's going to be the next Rabbi Vadya, there's nothing stupider than that. Because literally, we're closer to a monkey than we are to Rabbi Vadya. Needless to say, when we talk about the Rambam, Rabbi Yosef Karo, Rabbi Akiva, any of the sages from the previous generations were not even a monkey next to them. So one of the things that a person needs to know is that when you respect your rabbi, it's not because he's the biggest rabbi in the world and he knows everything, but rather because he toiled in Torah, he has good midot and it's therefore a Torah obligation for you to do so. Now, if he has bad midot, you're not even allowed to learn from him. Gemara Masechet Moed Katan 
says that a person that does not have good midot, he has bad midot, not allowed to learn to love him. So he can't be your rabbi. If he's a liar, if he's a, uh, a, a, a I don't know, a hater, if he's a jealous person, if he's a, you know, just has bad character traits that are, you know, character traits that are flawed, that, that, that affect his teachings, that affect his students, this person is not somebody that you can learn from. But if he has good character traits and he toils in Torah, that's enough. That's another reason that you have to respect him. Not because he's the biggest rabbi in the world and he knows everything. No, no rabbi knows everything. There is no everything. There's no end to the Torah. But rather, whatever he knows, he toiled for it and he's working on himself. And therefore, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, he's one of my messengers. He's my, my, one of my representatives. You have to honor him. Because honoring him is honoring me. Now, of course, if a person only values a chacham based on his knowledge, it's only a matter of time before he's going to disrespect everybody. Why? Because you will always find somebody lacking in something. There's always going to be something that you can tell the rabbi that he may not know. Now, you would think, yeah, but I'm new. I'm only a Baal Tshuva for two years or five years. He's already been learning for 30 years. How could I know more than him? You don't know more than him. You just know this one thing more than him. You're not comparing full knowledge versus full knowledge. You're comparing this one thing that you learn about this week's parasha versus what uh, you know he learned about this week's parasha. But if you compare all of his knowledge versus all of your knowledge, there's no comparison. So it's a person needs to understand that the Torah is not something that you can just simply acquire in one day or one week or one year. It's a lifetime of work. And the honor you give to a rabbi is not because he has all-encompassing knowledge about everything and anything. There's no such thing. It's about the Torah that he taught for and the midot that he has. And therefore it becomes a Torah obligation to honor him. When a person understands that this is the case, then it's easy to honor rabbis, it's easy to honor Talmidei Chachamim, Quite frankly, when I see Talmidei Chachamim, it, I don't really think there's anything that excites me more. Literally, I want to kiss their hands, their feet, their, their anything. Real Talmidei Chachamim, I don't know how much they know, but I know somebody's Talmid Chacham is nothing greater in the world. Nothing great. What? Because I understand these people are servants of Hashem. These people are servants of Hashem. These people are the greatest thing in the world. Now, of course, to know... Uh, 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 whether someone's Talmud Chacham or not is not uh, always easy because sometimes people look like they know a lot but in reality they don't know they just know a few things and they make enough of a stink about them that it makes it seem as if they know more than everybody else similar to those uh, Reshaim those Israelites these idiots Goim that uh, they're not idiots because they're Goim because there are many smart Goim but they happen to be one of the, uh, the, the idiots among the nations, instead of the righteous among the nations. Now, these idiots have been making a bigger stink lately. I had a few people send me messages about them and uh, say, oh, this is concerning, anti-Semitism, Kanye West is talking about the Israelites. Now, I know these morons from years ago. I remember when I lived in New York, you always had one of these Amaleks in the middle of the street wearing something that he bought from a costume store and he's yelling and screaming the New Testament but he's you know pretending as if he's reading the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai and he's reading it in English because none of them know Hebrew and uh, you know yelling at everybody that they're the righteous they're the original Jews they're the uh, the ones and the Jews of today are fakers and, and and so on and so forth now of course at that time that I saw them initially I didn't know anything about Judaism so there's not much to argue here. I just knew they're idiots because uh, just the way they behave. Today, Baruch Hashem, after Baruch Hashem, I've had enough time uh, to, to learn enough that they're morons. Why are they morons? Because their entire premise of everything in regards to being an Israelite and the original Hebrews and they're black and all this racism, all of that can be crushed in literally just a few sentences. There's no need for a debate. I would never have a debate with one of these people because, again, they're violent people both, both verbally and otherwise. And even more so, they're simply mental midgets because they don't even know what they don't know. First and foremost, your religion of Christianity 
and it is your religion because you're reading the new testament anyone that reads and follows the new testament is a christian there's no question about that god did not give the new testament to am israel at mount sinai new testament did not exist okay so anyone that reads new testament you are a christian rule number one number two you are reading let's say you say no no i let's say if i take aside and i don't read the jesus part the matthew and the luke and the stephen and the joes whatever it is in there all these idol worshipers let's say i discount them i'm reading from the old testament like they pretend like they do i'm reading from the old testament the real word of god okay buddy let's see you read read it to me read me the first verse in the beginning oh hold on a second i said read it in the, in the beginning well no 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 read it in the beginning i'm reading in the beginning it's not in the beginning where does it say in the beginning well it says right there no no oh, you're reading the new testament in english it says bereshit bara elokim et ashamayim ve'et ha'aretz it's in hebrew it's not in english your translation is a manipulation don't tell me that you that came a thousand five hundred years after am israel received the torah you're gonna come to my house to my religion to my torah and tell me what it says when you don't even know the language for heaven's sake so that's argument number two the end now of course if you want to deal with the whole race card this is what makes them stupid the first two makes them ignorant the third one is what makes them stupid why they claim to be the original jews because the original jews according to morons were black now all you need to do is read the torah to know there could never be a possibility that the original jews were black why where did the jews start from they're gonna tell you all types of mumbo jumbles depending on who the yeller is but the truth is where did ami said start from Avraham, Avraham Avinu. So where do we learn about Avraham for the first time? Where? They're going to tell you, oh, we learn about him in Parashat Lech Lecha. No, it's not Lech Lecha, it's Lech Lecha, and it's not that. We learn the first time about Avraham at the end of Parashat Noach. Noach, ish tzadik tamim bedorotav, Noach. That's the Parashat. At the end of Parashat Noach, we learn about the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel actually one of the people that was part of the tower of babel one of the wicked people was avraham's father terach okay now this is where everything was but ba- uh, babel had a place in it called ur kazdim that's where avraham was thrown into the fire by nimrod where is babel that's babylon that's iraq iraq if you want to see it in english it's go find me one african-american black guy in iraq find one you're not gonna find now i love black people i have plenty of black students and black friends but don't tell me that the color of your skin means that you're righteous or you're wicked and even make it to seem that if i'm not the same color as you therefore i'm not good this is moronic even more so when your whole testament is literally something you can collapse in a matter of a few minutes because you don't even know your own history you don't even know your own history you're gonna tell me they came from black people where did avraham come from he came from iraq eating madbucha eating falafel eating shawarma not eating a uh uh, uh, uh a, the, the food that you like he's not eating hot wings he's eating falafel He's eating shawarma. This is where this is this is where Avram came from, and after that, Avram. Where does it say this? It says it in the Tower of Babel, but even more, it says it in the verses themselves, where it says, "Vayichit Terach shivim shana vayolad et Avram et Nachor ve'et Haran ve'elat oldot Terach Terach olid et Avram et Nachor ve'et Haran ve'Haran olid et Lot." English. When Terah, oh, this is, yeah. Uh, when Terah had lived seven years, he begat Avram, Nachor, and Aran. 
Now these are the chronicles of Terach. Terach begat Avram, Nachor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died in the lifetime of Terach, his father. In his native land, in Ur Kasdim. Where is Ur Kasdim? Go look on Wikipedia. It's in Iraq. Iraq. Saddam Hussein. Former leader. That's where Iraq is. Now if you want to know further, where did, where did they go after? Vaykach terach et Avram bno vet lot ben Haran ben bno vet Sarai. Kalato eshet Avram bno veitzu itam miur kasdim lalechet arts aknan vayavu ad Haran veishvu sham. Where's Haran? Terach took his son Avram and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and his daughter-in-law Sarai. That ends up being Sarai later on. The wife of Avram, his son. They departed with them from Ur Kasdim to go to the land of Canaan. They arrived in Haran. And they settled there. Where's Haran? Where is that? Ethiopia? Where is that? Jamaica? Where is that? Nigeria? Where is it? Turkey. Turkey. You know Turkey? Thanksgiving Turkey? There's a country called Turkey. Before there was Thanksgiving Turkey. That's where Haran is. Go find me a black person. That lives in Turkey. He was born there. And is from the time of Avram Avinu. So, you see Rabotai, those idiots, and I emphasize, idiots, are people that are a danger to society. Why? Not because of their demeanor and their gigantic size and their weird clothes, but rather because when they speak, they speak in such a demeanor, with such... Mm, oomph behind their voice and command of their beliefs that it actually sounds like what they're saying is true. So people follow them. In to Genom. And guess what? They're also going to go to Genom. Who's not going to go to Genom? Someone that studies and doesn't make things up based on their preferences of their skin color and their shoe size and their hair preference and even what gel they put in their hair. You want to be righteous? Follow the way of God of Israel. Not the God of the Israelites and the God of the Christians and the Messianics and all these Baba Meisters that are out there. Follow the God of Israel. Who's the God of Israel? Five books of Moses. Read it with commentary by Rashi. You'll understand a little bit more. After that, we can talk further because there's a whole lot more to the Torah than what you're seeing. But first thing you have to do, abandon those false beliefs and that wicked, wicked behavior that's abusing society and the public at large. And even more so, stop claiming to know more than the Jews who received the Torah at Mount Sinai and are observant to that Torah till this day. Stop pretending you know more than us when you don't even know our language and neither do you even know our God. You know something you created and you are acting simply like a fool that's going to end where foolish people are, like Ephron. So this, Rabotai, is something that is a cancer in society today because there are speakers that know how to speak sometimes they'll be in the middle of a street sometimes they'll be in a church with 250,000 people sometimes they'll be in a stage at a ted talk and they speak in a certain demeanor certain amount of confidence certain amount of information certain amount of cockiness that is impressive upon the weak the ignorant and what ends up happening is that they take advantage of those little innocent sheep now, why are the innocent sheep allowed to be taken? Why does God allow it? Who told you to be a sheep? You could have been the shepherd if you learned Torah. Now, will you be able to learn the entire Torah? No. Why? Torah is wider than the ocean. But you could certainly learn a lot of Torah. And at the very least, not be a sheep. If you have a rabbi that knows a lot of Torah, and at the same time, 
is willing to admit when he doesn't know and when he makes a mistake which shows that he has good character traits then you have somebody that you are obligated to honor but if you have somebody that's never willing to admit that he's wrong and needless to say has problems with arrogance and all types of other weak character traits even if he's the greatest speaker on planet earth you're not allowed to learn from him why he's a wicked person let him do tshuva before he wants to help you but if he has good ones certainly you're obligated to respect him so let's see what's the next question Can Hashem cause a person to become mute based on certain sins? And is it possible if a person would know if they have a debuk? Can a per- can Hashem cause? Answer is yes, regardless of what the uh, the uh, what uh, what you would have there. Hashem can cause a person can do anything he wants. It's his world. He can play with it like putty. Uh, Hashem can do anything. Can he cause him to become mute uh, for certain sins? There were certain things that are not even sins that can cause a person to be mute. We discussed them last night in the Shiu, uh, that uh, Jewish intimacy, where the Gemara uh, says in Masechet uh, Nedarim, uh, I think it is, uh, was Nida? No, Nedarim. Masechet uh, Nedarim that uh, uh, the, the way that people uh, are intimate with their wives and what they do can even lead to certain people being born mute. Uh, needless to say, certain people can lose their speech in the middle of their life for certain sins so that we see it happening in the world. There are certain people that uh, get a stroke and they're no longer able to speak. There are certain people that uh, get all types of things. I actually saw it myself one time where there was somebody that uh, one time decided to tell another person uh something uh, that wasn't so nice something that wasn't so nice there was a person that uh, asked them a question after they heard it in a shield and uh they said listen i heard it from rabbi such and such uh what do you think and this rabbi said ah he doesn't know what he's talking about that's what he said now um how do i know this is this exact story that was told to me and uh i said oh okay so that person that student from that moment on lost respect for that rabbi and uh ended up causing him harm you know losing uh you know told people about it you know the lashonara spread and caused some people not to come to the shield but what happened to that rabbi it wasn't uh, even a month before that rabbi got a uh, a brain aneurysm and lost his ability to speak for an extended period of time now, Baruch Hashem, he uh, learns Torah. I'm hoping he did tshuva. Eventually, Hashem healed him, and uh, he was able to speak again and live again and so on. But certainly, this is something that uh, I've seen with my own eyes. I've even seen people say things against people that uh, uh, one guy said something against a different rabbi that I know. This is a story that I was part of. Uh, literally, I think it was a matter of maybe four or five months later, maybe less, the guy got testicular cancer that he's still suffering from to this day. So certainly Hashem can bring uh, uh, damages on a person for doing certain sins. Now, as far as uh, the second question about whether a person has a debuk or not, there are ways to find out, uh, you know, certain things like this. But uh, this, I don't think this year is uh, uh, really the place to do it. I, I can tell you something simple. If... Uh, you can think about the uh, Yud K Vav K, the name of God, those four letters, and focus on that name. You don't have a dibuk. If you can't focus on that name under all conditions, and you're a Jew, I'm assuming, uh, then uh, uh, that's uh, you know it's possible, but not necessarily a certainty. But you know, of course, there's other things. But uh, generally speaking, most people are just uh, a little bit crazy, and uh, you know they don't have any dibuk. Uh, next question a holy rabbi teaches us that hashem gave each person the tools necessary to complete his or her mission successfully in life how can each one of us know our true mission in life 
I actually have several uh, uh, shurim and short Torah clips about the true mission in life. So the first person, that, uh, uh, first thing that a person needs to know about the mission in life is number one, watch those shurim because they're more extensive than I'm going to be since I covered this before. Number two, a person needs to know that there are two parts of the mission. One part of the mission is a general mission as part of the nation. The other part is an individual mission. Now, the uh, uh, person needs to fulfill their obligations, serving Hashem, doing the mitzvot. If it's a woman, she has to fulfill the mitzvot of a woman. If it's a, if it's a man, she has to fulfill the mitzvot of the man. And do all of that. Though By doing that, it's going to lead you to get clearer answers of other things you need to address in your life. And typically, the, uh, the way that Hashem does it is by making the things that uh, are uh, uh, most, most difficult for you, most difficult for you, those are the ones that are your mission. Those are the ones that are your mission at that time. Now, even if you achieve them, don't think that you're finished because there's usually another part to the mission, but you can't handle the second part until you handle the first part. So Hashem is not going to give you your entire life's mission on day one because it would simply cripple you. But He's going to give you in certain times of your life. Once you pass stage one, there's going to be stage two. Once you pass stage two, there's stage three, and so on and so forth. The more you achieve, the more you're completing your tikkun. But if a person thinks, oh, you know what? So maybe I should be really slow with completing my first part so I won't get anything more difficult. No. Then you're just going to end up going up to heaven uh, and having a bill that's still unpaid and you'll have to be reincarnated again. So a person needs to do the best they can with what they have in their life. And typically... The, uh, the biggest part of the uh, mission is what's most difficult for you. If it's most difficult for you to be modest, that's a big part of your mission. If it's most difficult for you to give tzedakah, that's your mission. If it's most difficult for you to be honest, that's your mission. If it's most difficult for you to, uh, whatever, do something else, that's your mission. So it's, a, uh, it's important for a person to know that these missions are part of the servitude of Hashem. They're not something else. It's not like, oh, my mission is to build a spaceship and go live in Mars for a weekend. That's nobody's mission. That's nobody's mission. Your mission is to do certain things in life, and they are part of the servitude of Hashem. They're not uh, uh, these other things. As far as what you do for work, making a living, and so on, so long as it doesn't get in the way of your mission, it's not a problem. But uh, for anybody that thinks that their mission in life is to go to outer space or to be the most successful uh, broker in history, or the most successful investor in history, or the most successful anything in history, that's a mistake. Uh, you know, this is, uh, your, your success uh, has nothing to do with your mission. Uh, it's, 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 it's something completely separate from it. Uh, see, I heard a rabbi say that the Holy Zohar teaches that Yitzchak was sacrificed at the Akedah. However, the Torah says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu stopped Avraham from sacrificing it. How can both versions be true? Uh, I'm not sure what the rabbi said, uh, so I can't say whether he's, uh, uh, um, you know, what he actually said, but I can tell you that what he meant to say, at least, is that Zohar HaKadosh says that Avraham Avinu uh, was so uh, zealous to fulfill the will of Hashem that he, uh, he started cutting uh, Yitzchak started cutting Yitzchak. He didn't cut him completely, but he cut him a little bit. And that's why Hashem said his name twice, Avram, Avram. Uh, like, stop, stop. Uh, so that's, uh, that's number one. Uh, because he wanted to fulfill, okay, I got all the way over here, let me at least do something. Let me at least do something. Uh, so that's one. Two, that's the reason what Zohar says that why uh, when it's after the Akedah, it only mentions that Avram Avinu returned uh, to his lads. And it doesn't say Avraham and Yitzchak because HaKadosh Baruch Hu took Yitzchak to Gan Eden to heal him. He had to heal him. Now, why did Hashem allow this to happen to Yitzchak? Uh, because Yitzchak had a... Uh, honestly, the first time I heard this, it confused me in a big way. So take it for what it's worth. If you don't understand, leave it at that. Don't ask follow-up questions about this next bit of information I'm going to tell you because it's too deep uh, for, for this type of shiul. Uh, but uh, if you don't understand, it's okay. If you don't understand, it took me probably, I don't know, eight years to understand this. And I still don't understand. So 10 years, 12 years, whatever it's been. Something I, I learned maybe 10 years ago. 
And it took me a long time to understand it. Um, and, uh, or at least in my capacity of understanding. Um, and, but for a long time it bothered me. So I'm going to tell you it because you asked the question and I remember the answer. So I'd say, uh, I have to tell you. But uh, if you don't understand it, leave it at that. Just simply leave it at that. There's just certain things in the Torah you're going to learn and you're not going to understand. Why? Hashem doesn't want you to understand at that time. When does He want you to understand? Sometimes else. It could be five years, ten years. There's certain things that I learned. It took me five, ten years to understand. Certain things I learned, I understood it right away. Certain things I even brought a chidush on. So the reason why Hashem allowed this to happen to Avraham is because uh, uh, the, least, the reason why He allowed this uh, cut to happen to Yitzchak uh, is because Yitzchak uh, had a feminine neshama. There are two parts of the neshama. There's one neshama, Hashem cuts it into half. The masculine part, the feminine part. It's both part of the same neshama, but Hashem splits it into two when He brings somebody into the world. And because uh, Yitzchak had a feminine part of the neshama, He wasn't able to bring kids to the world. So in order for Him to now be able to bring kids to the world, Hashem had to have this happen, whereas Neshama would leave for a moment and Hashem would replace it with a masculine Neshama. And the reason why it happened at that time is because this is the time where Rivka, the other part of the Neshama, uh, was born. So it happened at the same time. So now he was able to bring kids to the world, so now he's going to get the masculine part of the Neshama. And the reason why the feminine Neshama was there in the first place is because the feminine part of the Neshama had to do a certain tikkun that uh, it couldn't do any other way. Either way, the reason, the, the whole thing is very deep, very extraordinary, very beautiful, but can confuse you to the point of heresy if you don't uh, allow it to just simply be. But uh, it, your rabbi, what he said is what he at least tried to say is what I just said. And I'm sure that he probably said exactly what I said. But either way, if he didn't, this is the correct version. Uh, next, can I keep a gift that I know that was uh, bought from a Mechalel Shabbat store? Uh, yes, if you somebody bought something from a... Uh, a uh, store that does not observe Shabbat uh, and they give it to you, it's not really your problem uh, for multiple reasons. One, they could have bought it on a day that's not on Shabbat. Uh, number two, they bought it uh, and the person that's selling it could have been a goy. Uh, three, the uh, um, uh, the person uh, that bought it, even if he bought it from a Jew on Shabbat, he has an issue, but to give it to you is not an issue. So there's multiple reasons of why you can keep it. There's no problem. Uh, okay. How can I meet my husband's niece who is off the derech? I told, I was told to only show her love and not discuss religion with her. I feel I must help her. How can I rebuke her gently? Uh, the best way to rebuke people is by sending them one of the shurim, uh, send her the personal story. That's something that works for anybody that watches it. Uh, it's a movie, everybody likes movies, and it's a movie that uh, gives a uh, rebuke for everybody in the right way. For you to talk to her directly uh, is, is not going to be accepted at first, simply because her neshama is not ready, her neshama is rebelling. So in order for her to stop rebelling, something, someone else, something else has to shock her back into the system and create doubts in her mind about our current false beliefs. That's what the movies and other lectures' intention is. After that, you'll be able to talk to her until you're blue in the face. But to start the conversation is not uh, is not a good idea. And as far as all the people that tell you just show her love and don't talk to her, disregard them completely. And you shouldn't talk to them about it either, though. Don't tell them what you're doing. Just simply do it. Just like uh, Rivka said in this week's parasha, uh, at the end of the parasha, when uh, Eliezer comes to uh, uh, to, uh, to to find a wife for uh, for Yitzhak. Uh he says to uh, 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 he says to Lavan and his mom that uh, don't uh, delay me. Uh, let me go back to my master. Uh, so they said, okay, let let us talk to the uh, to the Nara, to the young woman. Let's see what she says. They expected the, her to to say no, and it says Ve'ikrule Rifka. So 
So they said, they, they called her and they said, uh, would you uh, go with this person? And she said, I'm going. And the uh, uh, onkelo says, what does it mean? I, I, I'm going. It means she's going whether you like it or not. That's what Rashi says also. I'm going whether you like it or not. Whether you allow me to go or you're not allowing me to go, I'm going. So you have to be like Rivka. You have to, to why, why, why was Rivka going? Because she knew it's the will of Hashem. Why are you trying to tell this uh, young uh, niece of yours uh, about Torah, about mitzvot, about doing tshuva? Because the truth, when you follow the way of God, don't be scared. Just do what needs to be said. Don't, don't uh, discuss it with people. Don't tell them your agenda, your plan. Just do it. And Bezat Hashem, you'll succeed. Well, I was correct that the Yud removed from Sarai's uh, name, complained to Hashem, and was then given a spot in Yeshua's name. If so, what happened to the, uh, to, uh, the Vav uh, from Ephron's name? Oh, so this is Gemara. This Gemara about is also a uh, uh, Gemara that uh, David the Melech complained to Hashem that he didn't want to die on Shabbat. He wanted Hashem to change it. And there's a whole debate about the uh, uh, Hashem changing the Torah. And Hashem says that even if uh, to change a Yud, change a Yud one time, I changed the Yud and I had to uh, wait generations until I added it to uh, Yeshua Benun's name. Uh, name. Uh, and uh, so these, these letters, there's different Gemarot about it that talk about exactly what Hashem did with them, how he put it somewhere else. So there are multiple places in the Torah where there is a word that's spelled with a Vav and without a Vav. And this is one of the reasons. Uh, I think the original Gemara is Masechet Shabbat, if I'm not mistaken. Can men wear their wedding band and other jewelry such as a high necklace or ring? Can they? Yes. Should they? Depends on how religious they are. Uh, are is a man allowed to wear jewelry? Today, yes, since it's acceptable among society for men to wear jewelry such as uh, necklaces and, and rings. It's allowed for a man to wear jewelry. Would you ever find a big chacham uh, wearing a necklace or a ring? Most likely not. You're not going to see any pictures of Rabbi Vadya wearing a ring. But should we tell people, don't do it, you're not allowed? No, that would be wrong, because you are allowed. It's just that it's not uh, necessarily something that uh, most men do. I'm talking about men in the Torah, men in the mitzvot. Uh, certainly it shouldn't be something that's flaunting, flashy, and obnoxious. Uh, you know, that that's uh, certainly not uh, the right thing. Can you put a tzitzit Be'ezot Hashem on a newborn boy? Uh, yeah, there are, there are tzitzit for young kids, for, for, for toddlers. You can buy them uh, online. Uh, you can put it on them. Yes, no problem. Just make sure to, uh, that, you know, if it gets dirty, you clean it. But yeah, sure, it's no problem. Um... Is there any significance to Eliezer's name not being mentioned in the parasha? Instead of being called the Evid of the uh, man. Uh, sure, you know, the, uh, the Midrash says that uh, Eliezer really, um, uh, Midrash Rabbah, says Eliezer really uh, thought that uh, the reason why he said to Avram that, uh, um, that uh, if, if the woman doesn't want to come back, uh, you know, come back here to marry Yitzhak. Can I bring him to Canaan? Uh, can I bring him there? The Midrash says that really Eliezer was, uh, had his eye on, on Yitzhak to have Yitzhak marry his daughter. Have Yitzhak marry Eliezer's daughter. And uh, uh, so in essence, he was asking Avram, if I don't find somebody from your family, why don't Yitzhak just marry my daughter? You know, I've learned Torah from you. I follow you, um, I teach whenever you're not teaching, I take your spot, so, you know, I'm a loyal servant, why not have a, my son, your son, marry my daughter? And uh, Avram Avinu said to him, it's impossible, because you are Arul, and I am Baruch. Uh, it's impossible, because you are cursed, and I am blessed. Why are you cursed? Because the uh, you come from the Canaanite people that are cursed, and uh, I come from Shem, that's blessed. You come from Canaan, that's the uh, son of Ham, that's cursed. And so what's the problem? The problem is that your neshama, 
is uh, is is uh, your is is taking from the place of impurity. That's where it gets its strength. Whereas I, the Avram, my my neshama, my descendants, my family, we're taking it from Akadosh Baruch Hu. We're taking it from the holiness. You're taking your power from the impurity. We're taking it from the holiness. So it doesn't matter how much Torah you learn. A, uh, that, that's always going to have an impact on you uh, and on your descendants, and therefore our neshamot can never can never uh, marry each other, can never combine. You could be a student, you could learn Torah, you could do mitzvot, but you'll never be baruch. You'll never be baruch. You're always going to have your 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 parnasa, your shefa, your blessing coming from the places of impurity. Uh, so this is a reality, and that's that's why uh, the uh, a Jew cannot marry a Gentile. There's, we, everybody gets it from a different uh, source, a different source. Now, of course, everything ultimately comes from God. But again, God brings his, his uh, uh, sustenance to the world in different formats. So there's the holy part, there's the unholy part. The nations have their own angels. Each one of the nations has their own angels. The Jews uh, also have something unique they get from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But if a Jew lives in the exile... They uh, sometimes they succeed, they succeed a lot uh, because they get also from the other part. Uh, either way, the uh, uh, as far as money, but as far as the uh, 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 one of the things that uh, uh, we learned from this is that uh, Avram told them it's not possible for us to ever marry into each other, uh, and uh, because you're, uh, you're you're cursed, and uh, it could al- it's always going to be part of you. Uh, now, this is actually the reason why there are some Chachamim that uh, reject the idea that Eliezer was one of the uh, ten righteous people that went to Gan Eden uh, alive. And in fact, they say uh, that uh, Eliezer received, this is in a Midrash, uh, Eliezer received his blessing from God in this world, that Og came from him. Og, Melech Habashan, came from him, who ended up becoming an anti-Semite, enemy of God, enemy of, uh, of Am Yisrael. So uh, some say that uh, Eliezer actually became Og. Others that say, no, there's no contradiction. Rather, Eliezer himself was righteous, but his descendant was still, uh, you know, what it was, which ended up being Og. Uh, but of course, there are others that reject it and say that, no, it's a different, uh, it's a different Og. Because the original Og was from the time of Noah. The point being is, is that when it comes to uh, Eliezer, there are, uh, are certain reasons why uh, a person's uh, name is mentioned in the Torah. Uh, if there is uh, that name is not uh, have certain benefits that will teach us something, then Hashem excludes it, excludes it. Are you allowed to play the lotto, especially if you have in mind that you will, be as other Hashem, win? You will give some of the winnings to a Torah institution. Uh, the uh, Chachamim are mixed about it. Uh, the uh, most lenient opinion is that you're allowed to play a puta. What's a puta? Something that's so insignificant that if you lost it, it wouldn't matter. In today's world, it's $1, maybe $2. That's the maximum somebody's allowed to play in the lotto. Then, you know, like to buy those scratch-off cards for $10 and $25, like some crazy people do, that's not allowed. That's gambling. But to buy a lotto card for $1 or $2, and one, only one card, not 75 cards for $1, just one card, that there is room for leniency. That's allowed. Uh, but again, it's not something that a person should make uh, his life. Uh... Next question is, do the sages say anything about comparing a person to an empty vessel of water? Yes, a, uh, a, a person that is full of Torah is a uh, full bottle of, uh, uh, full, uh, uh, of water uh, because the Torah is a, uh, uh, compared to water. Where Torah goes, the Gemara Masechet Ta'anit says that the Torah goes to the lowest place. Uh, just like water goes to the lowest place. What does it mean Torah goes to the lowest place? The person that's most humble gets the most amount of Torah because the more humble a person is, the more Torah Hashem gives them. Just why 
uh, Moshe Rabbeinu uh, received the Torah and gave it to Am Yisrael because he was the humblest man of all time. Uh, so a person that has a lot of Torah is a, a bucket or a vessel full of water. A person that doesn't know Torah is an empty bucket of water. This is also a, uh, another analogy or comparison is the, uh, that uh, Am Yisrael is considered like a, uh, the, uh, the, the, full, uh, the full keg, whereas the nations are considered like the remains at the bottom of the keg after you've emptied it out in the eyes of Hashem. That's how much more important Am Yisrael is uh, in the eyes of Hashem than the nations. Not that he, Hashem hates the nations, but rather being the chosen uh, nation has a significant impact. But again, the chosen that we're referring to here are the righteous people that are following God's way. Not the lefty liberals, atheists that are anti-God. We're not talking about them. We're talking about the people that follow God are uh, much more significant in the eyes of Hashem than anybody else on earth by a significant margin. Uh, next, uh, uh, what made Avraham Avinu be considered the first Jew, uh, while technically Judaism did not exist at the time and was not able to convert? Why this same uh, criterion for being considered a Jew is not applied to today? So uh, that's because Hashem decides when everything starts, and uh, Avraham Avinu uh, was a uh, uh, called Avraham Aivri. Avraham that uh, was called the Hebrew, but really was Ivri because he was on one side and the rest of the world was on the other side, where everybody else in the world was idolatrous people, and Avram was really the only one that was willing to fight for God. Even the few righteous people, uh, like uh, like Shem and Evel, were not uh, fighters uh, for, for the Torah. Uh, so Avram was willing to fight for God. He jumped into the fire in Ur Kasdim. He fought the four kings because they were looking to, uh, you know, go against God. So Avraham Avinu was the only one that was willing to fight for the sake of God. And therefore God, after giving him all the tests, decided that Avraham is going to be the beginning of the Jewish people, where he would bring a descendant, Yitzchak. Yitzchak will bring Yaakov. Yaakov will bring the 12 tribes. And 12 tribes will eventually culminate and receive the Torah at Mount Sinai. Uh, and that's uh, so the the uh, the nation of Israel officially began with Avraham through Yitzchak, uh, whereas the uh, um, the reason why it was not before it is because all of the nations uh, came from Noach, not just uh, Jewish people. Uh, and Adam Rishon, most of the people that came from him were destroyed, and everything restarted with Noach. So in essence, it was like a whole new creation at the time of Noach. But from Noah came the rest of the uh, rest of the world. But he had three different sons. From Avraham, he had two different sons with two different mothers. The the the, the righteous uh, uh, Sarah, she gave birth to Yitzchak, and from him comes Yaakov, and from him comes the twelve tribes, uh, the twelve sons, and from them come Am Israel. They that's why uh, Hashem also gave uh, Yaakov, the grandson of Avraham, the name Israel, uh, Israel, that uh, ends up becoming the name of the Jewish people. Uh, so, uh, and we received the Torah at Mount Sinai 3,333 years ago, 334 years ago. And uh, we, uh, at, at that time, is a, uh, uh, that's when the Jewish people officially began as far as, uh, uh, as the nation. Initially, it started with one, and then it culminated and, and got to the point of uh, the nation itself getting the official commandment at Mount Sinai. But it had to start somewhere, and we cannot say that it started before Avraham, because everything restarted before Avraham. Uh, whereas this specifically was the decree of God that everything begins with Avraham and specifically to Yitzhak and so on. Today, we can't do the same thing because the Torah was already given. And at the time that the Torah was given to the world, there were certain laws that uh, changed in the world. Where before the, Torah, before the Torah was officially given to Am Yisrael, there were certain things that were allowed uh, to people that became forbidden. For example, before the Torah was given, even though Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov knew of the Torah and they followed the Torah, they, were, they weren't obligated to follow the Torah. So there were certain things that they were allowed to do that at the time of receiving the Torah, they would not be allowed to do. One of them was to marry sisters. To marry sisters, you were not allowed to do. And this is actually, Chachamim says, the reason why uh, Rachel, uh, Hashem took her neshama and she died before Yitzchak officially entered uh, Israel, uh, Canaan, 
uh, because uh, you know his, his marriage to her and her sister would not be acceptable inside the Holy Land. It was allowed outside of the Holy Land, but not inside the Holy Land. Uh, same thing with the parents of Moshe Rabenu. The parents of Moshe Rabenu, uh, uh, Yochevet and uh, um, uh, Amram were uh, were uh, aunt and uh, uh, she was his aunt. Uh, and the Torah says you're not allowed to marry your aunt. So they had to get a divorce. Uh, and so on and so forth. So there were certain things that were allowed before Matan Torah. Uh, that were allowed before Matan Torah, but that changed. Even the laws uh, of, uh, of uh, that, uh, some laws pertaining to the Gentiles, uh, some Chachamim say changed as well. Uh, uh, certain things that relate to them as well as for Jews. So as far as the, uh, to, to start uh you know uh, f- f- new now we can because we already have the torah we already have the defined law and this is the law that will always be there's no changing this law because shem said specifically this torah will never change once he said that that was the end of uh, change uh okay i think i'm done let me see this part should be a clip in itself. I'm not sure which part you're talking about, but if you want anything to be a clip, anyone that wants any parts of the shoeing to be a clip, just send us the timings, the exact timings of when it begins and the exact timing of when it ends, and uh, we'll have uh, somebody in the team cut the clip and, uh, and release it uh, if you find something interesting. Uh... When a person is is or has been reincarnated, which person inherits the world to come? Very interesting question, and the uh, the, the answer is too built up to answer the whole thing. But I can tell you this: that there is reincarnations, but it's it's the same neshama, but it's not necessarily the whole neshama. It's not the whole soul, uh, because the soul breaks up into pieces, similar to like a fire. Where if you take, let's say, for example, you have a fire and you want to light another fire. When you light the second fire, or even a thousand fires from that original fire, it doesn't lower that fire, but it still, you know, has split into other parts or created something else. Same thing with the soul. The soul can be split into an endless amount of pieces. Now, which part gets uh, reincarnated? It depends on which one did the best tikkun. The best version is the one that gets reincarnated eventually. Uh, the best version is the one that gets the olam ba, I'm sorry, the world to come eventually. And if multiple did the best part, then they combine again. Uh, best advice for a man wanting to convert to Judaism. Uh, look at the uh, conversion syllabus that we have over there. It has a, uh, a syllabus and instructions, and there's also some videos, uh, links to some videos. And if you follow uh, the, the syllabus... Uh, you know, and, the, and the, all the videos that are in it and on the playlist that's connected to it and everything, you'll have plenty of instructions to follow to get you to the uh, place of success. Uh, that's number one. Number two, you have to uh, be patient but not lazy. Uh, that's number two. Number three, don't have any expectations from anybody. Uh, no one owes you anything. You have to make sure you have to push yourself to, your, to do your best to earn your spot in the nation. Because no one is going to uh, 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 make it easy for you because that's not necessarily people's job and it's not God's job to make it easy for anybody to join the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish people. Uh, and I actually have a lecture about that. that uh, you know, that's, I have several lectures about Judaism uh, as far as conversion is concerned. And I think anybody that watches the, the, the ones that are uh, regarding the conversions gets a real reality check of, uh, of what Jewish conversion really is. Uh, and, uh, uh, this will go a long way to shut the mouth of the arrogant to think they know more stories. Than yeah, thank you. Okay. Oh, here we go. That's the one I was looking for because I know that it was deleted before. Uh, Jeremy said, I saw a Gemara, uh, I saw a Gemara in the Haggadah of Tubishvat. Okay, saying that one of the rabbis said you'll be punished for every delicious fruit he saw and didn't eat. How does this work with Kedoshim to you? You taught us that Chazal said it means that to sanctify yourself with what you're permitted to do. 
Uh, okay, it's a very good question. Uh, so when, when the Chachamim say that you'll be punished for everything that you didn't enjoy in this world, it's, uh, it depends on what you didn't, why you didn't enjoy it. Meaning that if you have something, Hashem gave you a blessing, uh, give you a blessing of something, and you chose to not do it, not to take, accept the blessing because you simply are rejecting the blessing from God, and you don't have a, uh, a, a real reason to do it that's connected to God. Meaning you're not rejecting it because you're trying to elevate your soul to get closer to God. You're rejecting it because simply it's not good enough for you. You want something better. You want something different. Then that's a problem. You're rejecting a blessing that Hashem is giving you. On the other hand, if a person has the ability to, let's say, for example, be very, very rich, but they choose to live a very humble and modest life, similar to, let's say, Rav Steinemann. Now, he did it for the righteous reason. He didn't want to benefit from this world because he wanted to be completely for the sake of Hashem and completely uh, reserve all of his uh, 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 blessings for the next world. This allowed him to connect to Hashem on an even deeper level. That's perfectly good. Uh, that's perfectly uh, 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 righteous. But if a person has the ability to benefit from something that Hashem gave him, but they simply don't want it, but it's not for that reason, it's for different reasons. It's because it's not good enough for them or, or other things that I just mentioned, then that's a problem and they'll be punished for it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Okay, oh, Baruch Hashem, I think, uh, oh, there's one more question here. Uh, what is the best way to improve emunah? Best way to improve emunah is practice. How do you practice? By watching the shiurim that we've made about the topic, learning them, studying them, trying to apply as much of them as possible, so when the tests come to you during your life, you're able to apply them to your life. That's practice. Practice, for it to be successful, requires preparation. So preparation is studying. Study, then you actually uh, go through life. Tests are going to come. You don't have to bring the test on yourself. Tests are going to come. And you're able to apply the law to the, what you learned which, uh, uh, during that time of the test. The more you're able to apply, the more successful you become in, in increasing your amuna. Uh, the, the less successful you are, the more you have to try again. Okay, Rabotai, thank you very much for learning with me. Hashem yivarech otchem bekol mikol kol, chayim arukim, shlemim, meleim Torah, mitzvot, gminut chasadim, nachat dubacha, bezot Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, will give each and every single one of us all the tools that we need to serve Him to the maximum potential, and when we continue to grow in Torah, to grow in mitzvot, to grow in yirat shamayim, in bitachon in Hashem, never have any doubts in Him, never have any uh, flaws in our emunah, never have any laziness, uh, uh, or, or lack of respect to our Torah, to our rabbis, to our sages uh, of this generation and past generations, and most importantly, never have any disconnect from Hakadosh Baruch Hu in all that we do. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen. Amen. Be honest with you, to give this lecture is a nightmare. If it was up to me, I wouldn't do it. There's going to be some graphic details. Not Midrashim, not Gmarot. We did that already. Where is Genom in Alacha? What did the Hasidim actually say about punishment? Is there suffering? Is there a physical place of fire or snow? We're simply trying to verify that Hashem takes vengeance against the sinners or not. Do you believe that angels, demons exist? We're doing a Ouija board video today. This is by far the largest near-death experience study that has ever been conducted. What happens the moment you die? person needs to know that he's not going to be a threat. Yeah, I went to a place of timelessness. It was me judging myself on what I could have done better. Not the rebuke of some book. This is a rebuke of a Kadosh Baruch Hu when we go up to Shemaim.